Hail, hail, the Celts are here, and what the hell do we care now? We are on the 11th hour, the final day of the last international break of the season, and we're just about to get back into action for the final hurdle of what has been a bit of a nail-biter of a season. I am Quinny, here for the Celts are here flagship podcast, and I'm joined, as always, by Josh. Josh, hail, hail, good to see you. Good to see you, good to be back. Obviously, it's been a it's been a long couple of weeks. We had a podcast last time, but been a boring week without without Celtic and club football, especially after watching Scotland get beat off Northern Ireland last night. So looking forward to Celtic back in action this weekend. Yeah, big time. It feels like international breaks, the the like the way time moves is very weird. Like in day-to-day life, it doesn't really change too much. But when you are like exposing yourself to football or whatever, it just feels yeah. like an eternity, you know, yeah. because we're used to fast paced, two games a week maybe. Or, yeah. you know, all the rest of it, news, training photos, whatever else is going on. And in these periods, there's absolutely denada on it. But there has been lots of kind of little touch points, breaking news. And I will be having a little bit of a preview going into the Livingston game uh, ahead of this weekend. There's plenty of stuff for us to get stuck into, Josh. I think the number one thing that an international break is probably top of the to-do list that we'll have a wee talk about and we'll, we'll get brushed aside is the hoops, the selps that have been travelling the world uh, representing their countries at all age groups and levels, senior and otherwise, and uh, you know how they've been getting on or whatever. I think that the, the top thing we've got on the agenda for the podcast today is Dyson Maeda coming back early from mm-hmm. Japan duty. Now, this was something we were worried about coming yeah. into the international break because Dyson has got this record with us. You know, we maybe need to look into the statistics of it of like getting into form, getting into ascendancy, getting his you know getting his uh, getting his groove on. And then an international break happens, an injury might happen off the back of that, a bit of international fatigue, whatever. But they went away, they are away at home. They played North Korea, scudded them. Mm. And then the second game has been called off because they can't get into North Korea or whatever. Yeah. So we yeah. did hope that Dyson was going to only feature half the international window um, through like the manager, Morishige, maybe doing as a turn or whatever. But mm. it, there's just no second game for, for uh, the Blue Samurai. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the name of the national team in Japan. So, uh, Tyson Maeda is coming back nice and early. That's got to be a huge W for this international window, yeah. hasn't it? Yeah, definitely, because he's one of those players who's is key to a lot of things. Celtic do, especially coming onto the form that he has, scoring that hat trick against Livingston. And you didn't want him to to get injured. It could have easily happened. To, let's be honest. And they pick up the one now, win against North Korea. Plays in ninety minutes. Uh, apparently played really well. That's obviously just going off Twitter. And then the game's cancelled or postponed or whatever it is in, in the other match, which is it's good for Celtic. Let's not beat around the bush. We didn't if we as fans had the choice, we wouldn't want any of our players to really play during the international break, would we? So you can be a bit selfish in that manner towards your club. So good that good that my is not playing and he's back fit and ready for this title run in because he's he's key to a lot of things Celtic do. Yeah, big time. And like like we were saying on the pod last time, like Maeda is one of these guys that you can't just take him out the cold and put him in the team and think you're going to get the best version of him. He's definitely yeah. a guy that needs reps and needs minutes. Mm-hmm. A high valuable 90 minutes for Japan won't will do him the world a good as well. Extra confidence booster and all the rest of it. I think, uh, you know, he did play very well from what I could see anyway, having not seen the match. But uh, it's a game against an official tie. This is a qualifier, so there's only five substitutes permitted. So tactically you know he's very important to japan yeah. been very important to celtic and it's good to have him back in town nice and early uh, but like you say we definitely would rather they weren't you know globe trotting and having to do all this stuff and we were maybe just ticking along with domestic football but i think in the last yeah the the christmas international break we've seen what has became the emergence the second the third coming of Mikey Johnson after he got a goal for Ireland off the bench and then came off the bench for us and got some goals and now he's away on loan. Is that maybe about to happen with Rocco Vata? I don't know. It's it's an interesting one. Obviously, you've got to take into account the fact his hat trick was against San Marino and we all know it's San Marino are. They're quite a poor team. But scoring a hat trick at international level is something that shouldn't be overlooked. He's a guy who has got a lot of interest in him, let's be honest. Scouts from Italian teams watching him constantly. The contract situation is not ideal. So to go probably, I think there is the offer on the table still there for him, but it's just about his decision at this moment in time. The second goal he scored was brilliant. Uh, kind of nutmegged the man, sat him down and fired in at the bottom corner. That was really good. And a, a positive performance from for his country. It wasn't the the ideal first half for Ireland. I think they were only 1-0 up, 2-0 up at the break. And away at San Marino, you're probably expecting more. And second half, they really come on to a game. All his goals came in the second half. So very positive from him. It was good to see Bosun Laval playing, actually. It was 
his shot that actually Vata converted in for his hat trick goal. Uh, I think Olsen Lawa was a bit angry at Vata for snatching it, but yeah, that's it's good to see them kind of linking up potentially because they could be Celtic first team players next season. But is he going to become that? I'm not entirely sure. During this running, well, Vata before has played striker, but he's more a kind of winger. You look at the guys Celtic have got out there. Yang's back available this weekend. Kuhn's coming on to a game. We spoke about Dyson Maeda. James Forrest is contributing now. So he scored the goal a couple of weeks ago. He's an option. And then you've also got Luis Palma, who will probably come back to fitness in, in a couple of weeks. So it's very hard for him to get minutes. And even if he plays up front, you've still got Kyogo and Adamida who are battling out at the minute and always still fit each week and getting match day squads. So it's hard for Vata to get the opportunities. But he has been giving them this season, and when he has, he's he's probably taken them. You look at the Bucky Thistle game, he scores, and he's done all right when he's come on, and then on the international stage, he's going and doing that. So it'll be interesting to see. I wouldn't bet on anything yet, because I think it could go either way. It's it's one of them. I wouldn't be surprised to see him renew, but also I wouldn't be surprised to see him move away. And if he does move away, he probably will get first-team opportunities over in Italy. He'll look at the success of guys like Aaron Hickey, Lewis Ferguson, who's absolutely flying at the minute. And it'll be an interesting one to see where his career goes, regardless of it's out with Celtic. Yeah, I do find it quite odd to gauge, you know, like where where Vata is and how good he is. You know, like yeah, we've mentioned a few times on the podcast. I know you watch a lot of the B team uh, in general. I managed to catch two games this year in the Youth Champions League live at the the Lesser Hampton Stadium, whatever we call it now. And like Kelly has been doing great for us, right? Kelly played all those games, and I thought he was good, right? But he, he didn't, didn't like. Yeah, he didn't. He stand don't, out. He, yeah. You don't see him and think, oh, he's a first teamer waiting to happen. But mm. and this the same for the, the when I've seen Vata, like is the same. I'm like, I don't I don't quite get it. I don't quite get yeah. all the success and all the hype. And I don't know if this is but like is it because he sounds Italian why all the Italian teams want him? Like no one like, you don't hear English teams interested, Spanish teams, Dutch teams, whatever. So it's maybe a maybe an agent connection or something, I don't know. But I just I, I I don't know, it's just a weird one with me because it's like, if he does have all that level of interest in him, and it is genuine, he is training with the first team, he is getting international youth camps, then, you know, like, why has he been buried with all the transfers that we've made? You know, he has yeah. been yeah. absolutely buried. You know, there's been no opportunity granted, and he has been on the scene. He's 20. He has 21 or something at this point. Uh, he's only 18. He's 18. 18, he? he's yeah. 18 I beg your pardon. But yeah, he, he, he feels like he should be a bit older because he's been definitely... Like yeah, he's have been kind of heralding him for a while, certainly, yeah. you know. So yeah, he's been, he's been on the scene for a fair while. I think he made his debut at the end of last season under Postecoglou, maybe around April time. Uh, yeah. So he has been kicking about for a while. Uh, it's it's a really tough one. I'm not sure. You're right. There hasn't been much interest from any other teams other than in Italy. If I can remember correctly, I'm trying to think. I don't think there has been anything from down south in the Premier League, uh, which you potentially would expect. Yeah, it's obviously maybe a bit of hype, obviously, because his dad's Rudy Vata. He's played for Celtic, and then the kind of Italian ranked his name. But at the same time, to be in the Celtic Academy and be playing for Ireland at international level, youth international level, you've got to have something. And he, he's, he's 18 years of age playing for the 21s. Usually at that, you'd be expecting him to play for the 19s. So he probably is playing a wee bit of a level up there. Uh, you could argue, but I'm not, I'm not sure. There's... I don't know. There's a lot of other guys in that B team who are good. Like, like you say, when we were watching them, the, like the likes of Kelly didn't particularly stand out. Vata didn't particularly stand out. Maybe there's potentially other guys in there who are on par with them who maybe, going by what we've watched with the B team, deserve the same opportunities as these guys. But it's just so hard when Celtic are bringing in these multi-million pound players who come in and, and just take up berths in the squad. Uh, the manager has always stated his desire to develop youth and, and all this. And let's be honest, he has given them a chance this season. Kelly is getting minutes at the minute. Mitchell Frames had his chances. And Vata maybe potentially deserves more opportunities. I'm not sure. A lot of fans have certainly called for it. But it will be interesting to see where the youth kind of development thing goes going into the summer and going into the next season because Celtic fans demand quality regardless. And it, it's a funny one because... If you bring in someone for six, seven million pounds, right, as a left back, the the fans are going to be really happy, right, regardless of who it is. A majority of fans will be happy if you spend that amount of money on a player. 
Whereas if you keep Taylor, obviously Burnaby's away on loan now. He's not coming back to January next year, whenever it is, December. If you bred a guy like Mitchell Freeman to the team behind Taylor and develop him as your kind of first team player throughout the season, fans probably aren't going to be too happy come the end of the window if you've not brought in a left back. So it's a tough situation. And at the same time, it's the same fans that are calling for Frame to get increased opportunities. So it's it's a very tough situation in terms of giving youth that opportunity uh, in the first team because there is a lot of talent uh, within the ranks. It's always been the case at Celtic, but it's just about giving them the right chances and it's it's a hard one to gauge. It definitely is because when you see Paolo Bernardo going and captain in the Portugal under-21s over two games and getting a goal as well, like I was listening to... Um, Les Ferdinand on the overlap this week. I don't know if anyone's caught it. It's a, it's a great episode. Like uh, like the guys on it or not. He talks about being a director of football and a manager and a few other bits and pieces. And anyway, one of the things he said that really resonated with me as a Celtic fan is when you bring guys in on loan from bigger clubs, you're happy to give them like 10 bad games before you'll rule them out. But any yeah. guys coming out your own academy, like one bad appearance off the bench and they're gone. You know, yeah. like that's how, how ruthless it could be. Whereas it should be the opposite where you're bringing your own guys through. You should give them, you should afford them the same opportunity, or uh, at least you know the same, you know I give or take the same as you would uh, something else. So I don't know if Bernardo quite fault because he has on loan, of course. Yeah. Maybe we're having a wee try before you buy situation with him, but it does feel like <clears throat> with Kelly coming through, there's maybe been a wee bit of that change yeah. of mentality a little bit. Well, like we've seen with Frame going ahead of Bernabe in the past as well when he was fit. I know he's been injured and stuff. So, but it's just weird how Vata doesn't really seem to get that. Uh, yeah. He's not really had, and there's been plenty of winger crises at the club this year. So I just don't really know where I, I, I lie on the VATA thing. You know, I'm, I'm quite sure with first team minutes, he'll get better because that's just the way football is. Yeah. Everyone gets better the more they play, the higher the level they play, the better. This is a guy, but like at the end of his contract, he's like 18, 19, 20, you know, that teenager year. He has been on the scene for a while. I think it's maybe just because of his name. I've maybe been aware of him on Twitter and stuff like that, maybe since he was 15 or whatever, coming through at Celtic, perhaps because of his dad and whatever. And that's why I've got his age a wee bit upside down in my head. But, um, like, yeah, like, why don't we have this guy on a longer contract? And why isn't he, like, Quan? Like, why isn't he out on loan at Motherwell yeah. or Hibs or St Mirren or something yeah. like that, getting mm-hmm. 20 games a season? Like, in the January, I had a wee sneaky suspicion Adam Montgomery might have got some minutes for us because he's been on loan for a couple of years. He's had high-value yeah. minutes. He's been SPFL level, undoubtedly, you know. Um, what that's worth to us, who knows? But yeah. it's definitely like right. shown that. It's un- but yeah. If you put him in the team at left-back, you would know within a reason what you would get yeah. from him. The thing you're not Mon- going to get that with some of these other people because yeah. they don't get that same minutes. Yeah, the thing with Montgomery is he's just constantly injured. He's got like a three-month yeah. hamstring injury at the minute, so it's tough uh, for him. I really rated him, actually. See, when he came into the team under Postacoglu initially, I thought he was actually quite decent. Uh, and like a lot of guys who have maybe had that opportunity, Dane Murray before, we've seen him coming into the team. He's just had continual injuries. And Frame, you don't want Frame to fall into that bracket. So it is, it's tough for these guys because um, they want to keep fit and they want to get the opportunities. But I, I, I do ag- agree with you. That it's just so hard. Like that kind of whole thing of giving the academy players time at a club like Celtic where the demand for success is so high from everyone at the club, from the manager to the board, to the the fans, f- to your fellow teammates. Everyone wants the best. And when you've got a guy, a wee 18-year-old boy who's coming into the team and He's not going to really put in eight, nine out of ten performances every week like you want. It's fans naturally get frustrated. And that's the whole part of the reason why when Brendan Rodgers brought Mitchell Frame on in the Champions League, he played him at left wing and not left back because Celtic are holding on to a 2-1 lead. If he puts that boy on at left back and he causes a goal, he's getting hounded by the fans and he's probably going to have that bad reputation. Uh, so put him on at left wing, much, higher, much less of a risk. So it's... It's interesting. I'm not sure where the the situation with bringing in young players is gonna is gonna go because I I look at the team and there's a lot of good boys in there. Sean McArdle is one who sticks out for me. I think he's only 16, 15, 16 at the minute. A young midfielder. He he looks really good. Uh, got a good left peg on him. So there are a couple of standouts in there. You know, just be interesting to see where they go in terms of getting minutes. The boy we liked in the B team got alone at Queens Park. What's his name? Cars. Yeah, Mackenzie Cars. Yeah. Uh, he's not really been getting a lot of minutes there. I think he started like one or two games. Uh, he's substitute appearances he scored. Uh, for them in fairness, away at Dunfermline. Uh, he's out there with Ben McPherson, who's also known from Celtic. 
Uh, he just got an ACL or an injury similar to that a couple of weeks ago, so he's going to be out for a long while. But yeah, Carsey was the captain of the B team, and I, we did highly rate him when we seen him in the in the youth league. He scored that penalty against Lazio and he put it into the top corner. So he's one be interesting to see because he is nineteen. He is getting on a bit now, and when you get to that kind of nineteen twenty age at, at academy yeah. level. Yeah, 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 I get you. It's just yeah. funny to hear. That's all right. I know, I know. <laughs> but when you get to that age, you, you need to really start getting those opportunities and not be playing B-team football when you're 19, 20. So that's probably why part of the reason he's been out on loan. But there are a lot of interesting ones out on loan. Bosun Lawal, I, th- I think Bosun can come back and potentially challenge for a first-team place next season. Albeit you've got to take into account the level he's playing at the now. It's third-tier English football. But... You watch him and what he's doing. He's doing anything totally different to what a lot of Celtics midfielders are at the minute. And I just hope and pray to God that if there's anyone listening from Celtic at the minute, they don't play him in the defence next season. When he comes back from his loan, they play him in the midfield like he has been playing for Fleetwood. Because at the defence, he's in centre-back. I think he was only put there because of his height and his ball-playing ability. He's much better, much, much better in the midfield. See, every time I hear people saying that, because I've heard a few people, I've been chatting to some Irish people recently about Vata um, for unrelated reasons to the podcast. And yeah. uh, Otsunga Wild comes up in conversation. And see, every time I hear people saying that, I just get Yaya Touri vibes. Yeah. You know, I get a uh, all- guy yeah. gets put at centre back. People think, oh, he's a great big centre back. But then it's actually when you see him in midfield, you're like, oh, Jesus. Like, <laughs> this yeah. guy's actually yeah. got something about him. Yeah, I get Yaya Touri, Victor Winyama vibes off him. And. I'm really looking forward to seeing how he does. Actually, said guys from Celtic are watching him regularly. Coaches and stuff are coming down to watch him at Fleetwood, and he could easily be a candidate for Fleetwood's Player of the Year. Uh, the way their season's gone, Charlie Adam actually fair play to Charlie Adam. Obviously, make jokes about him, Rangers man, and things like that. But he's moulded Boston Lawal into this powerhouse of a midfielder, and he's done really well. And Charlie himself himself has said that Boston will probably come back to Celtic and compete next season. And he's contracted at the club until 2026, so he's still got two years left in his deal. And a lot of people forget when he signed for the club, going on a total divergence here to what we were planning and talking about, but when he signed for the club from Watford's academy, he won their academy player of the year when he was at 17, 18, playing as a midfielder. And then he comes to Celtic and they put him at the back and he goes to Fleetwood and he's excelling as a midfielder. So play him in midfield when he comes back. Please, Brendan Rodgers, if you're listening to the podcast. That's it, for sure. I think that's kind of so. I think when we we look at so all these things all kind of wrap into each other pretty well because like in terms of filling some of the gaps in the squad, like the likes of Kelly, maybe even with backup left back with Frame, is all well and good. But like you say, we do demand we win the league. We do demand we go into that new Champions League and we have some level of competition. You know, we we have a bit of threat about us somewhat, and the need for a left back at that level is apparent, as well as a goalkeeper. But we've yeah. had some renewed links, it seems, for Hugo Bueno down at Wolves. This is a left-back where we're heavily linked to in the January transfer window. Yeah. One that surprised me at the time, to be honest with you, and surprises me again that it's, it's resurfaced. I just don't see us buying this guy. I don't see him being available on loan. It's a weird one, but it's clear. It's, it's good to see that at least the left-back um, agenda is being pursued. Yeah, I know it's it's an interesting one. Like, Bueno, French played at Wolves. I think it's one where at the end of the January window, it was too late in the day for us to for us to go and sign him and, and bring him in. Portuguese, I, I don't know his age, what is he, 22, 21, something like that. Um, yeah. I know he scored for Wolves in the Cup, actually, uh, last weekend, or the weekend before last against Coventry, uh, however it was they were playing. The, the, the need for a left-back, you're right, is apparent. You look at Taylor... He's competent probably against most the majority of Scottish teams. But is he going to push you to that next level against in, in a Glasgow derby or in the Champions League, especially the newly formatted Champions League? You want someone with that quality. And at the same time, right, you look at a Sky Bueno, fans are wanting someone who's going to come in, like a 23, 24-year-old, 25 even, who will come in and contribute straight away. This boy Bueno, he's 21. And he has only something like, I'm just reading it here, it was 23 plus 18, I don't even know that gets you, I get you what, 41, 41 senior appearances to his name at Wolves, one cap for Spain under 21s. Is he that quality that you're looking for in a left-back? 
listen, he, pr- he probably is a talented footballer, 21 years old, he's got a high ceiling and high potential. But is he that guy that's going to come in and contribute straight away and be a solid option for you in the Champions League? I don't know. I've I've seen a fair amount of this guy at Wolves. I've had I've had the pleasure of the mispleasure of watching a fair amount of Wolves over the last uh, kind of year and a bit. And he's yeah. very good. He's very very quick, but he is small, you know. So I think the main problem we have with Taylor at left back is defensively, just one on one or recovery against. Like think about the pace here against the Champions League level in the wide areas. Like yeah. you need, he's got that pace. He could probably catch some people on on uh, on counter attacks and stuff. Uh-huh. But I'm not too sure if he's got the the defensive upgrades because he's a very attacking left back and for Wolves under the previous manager and the last one they've mainly had like wing backs rather than full backs yeah so mm-hmm. he's got a back three behind him or maybe he's played in a midfield five ahead of a back four there's been a few different things that have went on with him very attacking left back so that's the only kind of question I don't see this being a loan I don't see Wolves wanting to loan because of Wolves' situation they'll want transfer fees uh, especially if you see the way English financial fair play has been shaking out over the last uh, yeah. little while. They want every bit of positive pounds they can get their hands on. So it's not going to be cheap. Spain under 21 international, one cap or whatever, but still, yeah. uh, that will be on the, the player profile. That will add to yeah. the, the negotiations you've got to imagine. So uh, maybe not number one candidate, I would hope. We have had a lot of links in this window as well, this international window to goalkeepers I've seen as linked to yeah. Vassin, who we linked to, we were talk, chatting about last week, Kikir and whatever, not really much moves on that, but it's good to see left back and and goalkeeper from the last episode where we were chatting about that. There's been at least, uh, at least you know, the feelers are firmly out there and we should get, what we want from these positions is rapid action, you know, like yeah, as soon as we know we're winning the league, we're going into the Champions League, we want them to go, right, cool, target one, target one, go and get them, left back and keeper. Yeah, definitely. Six Matthew, million, yeah. Eight million, boom, boom, go get yeah. them. Yeah, because Rogers needs that and he wants that in the squad. He's he's obviously stayed that before. My fear is if Celtic come second and you're going into Champions League qualifiers, yeah, worry is that it's the same as what happened Bain. before. It's it's like, yeah, <laughs> we just have to wait and see. If they do win the league, then you want the business bang, 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 boom, 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 done. Um, but there's a lot of, I would say, lack of cohesion surrounding. The recruitment department at the minute, obviously, Law Mark Law departed. Joe Dudgeon, I believe it was, departed as well. So we don't really know who's running that at the minute. Is it just Rogers looking through his book of contacts from the English Premier League? Don't know. Just have to wait and see. It'll be interesting to see what happens over the summer because is there going to be restructure? I heavily doubt it. But is there going to be someone who comes in and leads this recruitment department? Probably because you can't have a head scout and a lead recruitment guy leave and not replace them. So there probably will be movement there. Yeah, for sure. So let's hope. But before, for us to do that, I, kinda, I guess that misses on quite well. But this weekend, we're back in league action. And it's against the aforementioned cup victims of Dyson Maeda. Yeah. Uh, Livingston are back. Uh, no, we're away. We're away to the final yeah. journey to the spaghetti had. To the, yeah, because yeah, they're going down, aren't they? To the pasta bowl, yeah. you know. It's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> The last one we'll yeah. be going there because we'll be going down. But I think Tony Macaroni are now ending their partnership with Abigail. Yeah. Maybe that's what we'll be calling it again. Yeah, sadly. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see who buys over the rights. I'm hoping someone stupid like KFC buy it. It's like the KFC Arena or something like that. But like, I, I'm trying to think of a better one than that. I don't know. Just trying to think of other like Scottish businesses. Like, Greg's, that be... the Greg's Arena. Greg's. Is Greg Scottish? I don't know. I'm yeah. thinking, like, I don't know, over the last couple of years, it feels like there's vaping shops everywhere, so I could see it being some <laughs> stupid, like, yeah. some sort of mad vape empire or something yeah. like that, I don't know. Because <laughs> Tony Macaroni is like, uh, yeah, like it's, it's, it's a, the Glasgow West Scotland kind of thing, isn't yeah. it? So, yeah, that's true, yeah. So maybe it's something like that, but uh, but yeah, it'll be our final, <laughs> our final journey. <laughs> the Tony Macaroni, uh, as it's called, and uh, maybe for the last time the spaghetti had, but yeah. This game is always weird to forecast because yeah. of the surface, because of the venue, and because we do all, always have someone who is nursing something, coming back from something, or as we now see with some of them, just we don't really want them playing on that pitch, please, especially with the running that we've got. So this is a big game of you know risk and reward, I think, because some guys are coming back. We've seen training pictures before, and it was bang on schedule with what we had on the calendar, Josh, from way back yeah. in January or whatever. Yeah. But we had training pictures of Rio Hitate 
right before the international break there. So you've got to imagine he's going to be somewhere in the first team squad for this one. Yeah, I would assume so. He played 45 minutes in a bounce game last week against St Mirren. So he'll probably be on the bench and he'll probably be on the bench at Ibrox. That's my that's my prediction, my prognosis of the situation. It'll be interesting to see where else the manager goes with the team. Obviously, Carter Vickers is crucial, but do you want to risk him on that surface? I don't know. And it's like you say, it's always a it's one of those tricky games, Livingston, because they've not got good players. Uh, the majority of players aren't good, but going through there, it can easily be tough. So it should be commended for what they've done at the Tony Macaroni earlier in the season, going down to ten men and managing to come through with a three-one victory. That was that was a, re- a very good result uh, back in like September, October, I think it was. First, listen, you take similar to that time. Um, as long as it was Joe Hart that gets sent off then, and then Scott Bain had to play the next game. So hopefully that doesn't happen this time around because then it's Bain at Ibrooks. But it will be interesting to see where the team is for this one, whether it's Ida, whether it's Kyogo. I assume it's going to be Kyogo. Because there is a lot of dilemmas everywhere. Yang coming back to fitness. Is he going to play? Does Kuhn continue in this surface? Maeda starts. O'Reilly probably plays. Is it Bernardo? Iwata, does McGregor come in? Because he said probably after the international break, McGregor will be back in the fold as well. So there's a lot of dilemmas. And it's good dilemmas that you want to have going into a game like this. Big time. I think, uh, so Hitati is probably quite on schedule and probably, I make you right, it, maybe he does start the game. Uh, but I think what... I think what we're hoping for is to be see McGregor and Tatati in the squad. It's been quite uh, ambiguous around McGregor. It doesn't feel like Rodgers and Celtic really know the extent of the injury. And then rumour mills have just been mad at different points, saying he's fine and then he's out for the season and everything else in between, certainly. So I think we really need to see some training pictures for this week to see where McGregor's at and then we'll have an idea. If he's anywhere near fit, I can see him starting and maybe sharing the 90 minutes with Hitati. Mm, yeah. Um, or maybe Hitati starts and we get 30 minutes out of McGregor at the back, perhaps, if McGregor is like really still on the treatment table and on his way back. But I think Iwata and O'Reilly yeah. walk into the team. Yeah, yeah. No, no two ways about it. But yeah. at centre-back, I think you, you raised the most interesting point with Vickers, because if we don't play Vickers, who right. do we play? Because right. <laughs> who is there? <laughs> if Vickers isn't fit, it's probably Welsh and Scales. Uh, or even Lager Bielka. Because he obviously came on for some minutes there, or maybe it's one where he, he definitely won't do this because he done it at the end of the the last game, the St Johnston game, and it didn't work out. But does he put a watt into the back? I don't know. I think it probably will be if Vickers doesn't play, it will be Welsh and Scales because Scales is back fit, and I should. So we think Scales is fine. Yeah, after yeah, Scales is fine. That's what the manager said before the international break. It was just one game, and he'll be back after it. So I think that was just a knock. And you maybe you don't want to risk him playing, I'm not sure. But Scales come straight back into the team, I feel. Uh, definitely, regardless. Just because of... he didn't play for Ireland, I just thought maybe yeah. it was a wee bit of a... Yeah, it could be, Watch but I, I, I assume he plays. If he doesn't and Vickers doesn't play, it's Welsh and Lager Bielka, which away at Livingston should be enough. My only fear is the boy Teddy Yenge. Now, he caused Celtic a lot of problems at Parkhead, scoring a good goal. Given the defence a lot of issues last time, he's like the new London Dykes uh, in terms of the way he plays and going to the Tony Macaroni facing him will be a challenge. So interesting to see where that goes. But the back line is one of the tougher ones. Obviously, Johnson's fit, recently qualified for the, the what is it, the, what's the American? Pop America. Pop America with Canada. Um, so that was good for him. Then Taylor will play left back. The centre-backs is just, it's not a tossy a coin, but... You wouldn't be surprised to see any partnership this weekend. No, defence is definitely right up in the air. I think the manager probably tries to do with Vickers what we did with St. Johnson. Like, mm. once we get to two or three ahead, let's yeah. say, man out of there. But just for the surface, cause we've seen, I know it was Ange, not Brendan, but we've seen Ange totally rest him away to Kilmarnock um, in preparation yeah. for an old firm, or a derby, yeah. I beg your pardon. Um, last year so you know it's not that's definitely medical advice it's not a manager advice i i would i, I would suggest you know so it's definitely one to, to watch out for in the yeah. midfield yeah we need to see training pictures but for me the front three probably picks itself the easiest at the moment yeah. like kyogo hasn't traveled or anything dyson's been back in town early and i know yang is coming off the suspension but i don't know i feel like it's couldn't start in position um, and yeah, no, definitely couldn't start couldn't starts he's on a really good run of form Two assists and a goal in his last three games. 
it'd be very harsh to drop him. You know, I've had that solid period training. Listen, Yang will be sh- fit and sharp as well because he's been in training. He's not it's like he's been injured missing the last two games. He has been fit. And Rodgers has said he has been impressing him. So it's good to have those options. Though, like, listen, if Kuhn's not cutting it for 60 minutes, you bring on Yang because we know what he can do. He's changed games before. So, yes, I'll be good. But you're right, the front three picks itself at the minute. Based on current form, Kyogo's coming on to a game. Ideally, you want Kyogo to score in this one. So that's three goals in three games going into the derby. That would be ideal. And then Maeda get, has his place in the team. He's getting that run of games now, like we said he needs. And playing for Japan will have only boosted his confidence as well. Yeah. I think like seeing that competition, if we have Kuhn and Yang in the form that they present themselves in at the moment, fighting yeah. for 90 minutes between the two of them, then we're going to get a lot of chances created on the right-hand side, you know. Yeah. No, no two ways about it. So that's something we've not really had the blessing of. One thing yeah. that did catch my eye that does uh, an international window that probably maybe features a bit better in the preview here for the Livingston game is uh, Odin Tiago home. So this guy's been kind of MIA all season and there's not really been much info come out around a lot of it. Mm-hmm. But seeing him represent Norway under 21s, I think it might have been today or last night, but the notifications were on my phone certainly quite recently. Um, he came off the bench against St. Johnson. Is he a guy that we can start to expect to see feature more often than not? Holmes are an interesting one. Listen, what age is he? He's, I'm just checking here. He's 21 years of age. And the manager has said in the past he's one that he rates highly in terms of talent and potential. Obviously, he's brought in. I didn't really expect him to contribute much in his first season, and that's proved to be the case. It's certainly one for the future. Nine league appearances, and obviously he comes on against St. Johnson. He did have an injury issue. But even with that, he hadn't played since the 25th of November before he came on on the 16th of March against St. Johnson. And that is a very long time. That's over three months. That's like three and a half months. I'm not sure about him. I genuinely don't know. He's had glimpses here and there, but he's shown what he can do. The St. Mirren game earlier in the season, it was a midweek game at Parkhead where him and O came on and they changed it and they combined for the goal that won the game. So he has shown signs of that. Is he going to be one who comes in between now and the end of the season? I think it's going to be a competition between him and Kelly for those minutes and, and getting those opportunities because kind of similar. I don't know about him. I genuinely don't. It's he's been, Like you say, he's been one of those ones where you've not really seen him much and he's not really he's not started many games. Beginning of the season, yeah, he was in the team. That was before the emergence of Bernardo, before Iwata started playing games. He was coming on and getting a decent amount of minutes when he initially joined. Obviously, he had that controversial Instagram post away at Aberdeen, was it? And that soon got deleted or changed. So, I don't know about home. What do you think about him? I would like to see him get these Bernardo minutes if he is fit, yeah. you know, because Bernardo is tidy enough, right? But we've spent money on holding home. We've got Kelly coming through. And when Hitate, McGregor, O'Reilly and Awata are fit, you know, like, we did, you know, I just... You know, because we've been kind of loosely linked to maybe trying to negotiate down Bernardo's buyout clause or, you know, maybe get him on loan again next year. <clears throat> again, kind of like I was saying earlier with the own, I know Odin Home isn't our youth product the same way Kelly is, certainly, but we've already kind of maybe invested in mm-hmm. that international youth prospect to try and get into midfield. Yeah. I'm not too sure. You know, but if he isn't good enough, then a guy like this, again, would only do better to have a wee loan spell next year if you were going to bring in Bernardo. But you wouldn't really be able to make a, de- a good enough decision on that just from training, I think. Because like you say, he has come off the bench and shown glimpses here and there. You know, I think the final game where he gets sent off, he was starting, didn't he? Um, um, I think he came on as a sub and gets oh, no, sent off. No, he came off the bench and gets subbed, of course. Yeah. Um, sorry, I beg your pardon. But I, was just, I just remember thinking, because he played Champions League and you know, that beginning part of the season, he was coming off the bench all the time and you thought, yeah. I know you said you didn't expect much from him and that's the way it's shaken out, but I thought we might have seen more of him. And that's what yeah. I mean. Like, there's just not been any intel on him. There's not been any, oh, he's got a hamstring injury for three months or he's done his Achilles or, you know, anything. It was just, he just vanished for a bit and yeah. now he's kind of back. You know, and I'm just like, yeah. you know, do we start to see this guy get more minutes yeah. and maybe... I don't know. He scored against Bucky Thistle in the cup as well. So he did yeah. start that game and he's done all right. He's come in. He's not really stood out, but he has shown glimpses of his talent. And it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I think he's definitely one who next season you'll probably see more of. Yeah, I could say I could go with that for sure. And uh, this is definitely is a big this is a good game where you could see the likes of Forrest and Ida coming off yeah. the bench and, and yeah. getting involved in the match. So this could yeah. be a good 
this could be a good one because we've been very good for using like all five subs. And you know, with the last three games that we've got before the split, we've got two games away from home, which I think is always really uh, the away end in these games is always uh, huge. It's funny because being away from home doesn't really feel like too much of a disadvantage when it mm-hmm. is the, the Tony Macaroni. Obviously, when we go to the, the Debt Dome or uh, Castle Grayskull or whatever you want to call it, we've not maybe quite got that same fan fingerprint presence yeah. at the game. And obviously, we'll be at home for St Mirren in the final game. But one of the things that's kind of bubbling up in the yeah. in, in the preview uh, into the game as well is it came out from the club that for the two women's games that we're going to have at Celtic Park this year, that we're going to have no... Green Brigade and Co. Yeah, so the latest statement from North Curve Celtic came out at quarter past ten. You know, we are recording this, it's currently five past eleven. So quite recent, uh, they've said that despite our best intentions and efforts, the club has refused to facilitate the Celtic end for the upcoming Celtic FC women matches at Celtic Park. So if anyone who's not familiar, Celtic women had two games uh, at Celtic Park at the end of last season where the Green Brigade and North Curve Celtic had this the Celtic end thing in the Jockstein Law Stand. And it was a really good initiative, I thought. It spurred the team on. It certainly created an atmosphere at women's games that perhaps has not been there before. And it was certainly a massively positive thing. Obviously, Celtic women didn't go on to win the league. They lost out in the final day of the season. But the support they got was terrific. And it's the club that have refused them uh, the, the opportunity to do that again for the games. Uh, the Green Brigade North Curve have said that the decision was taken by Michael Nicholson, the CEO, and Chris Mackay, the chief financial officer, uh, they say it is vindictive against the concept of the Celtic end, the fan groups behind the idea. And shamefully, Michael Nicholson and Chris Mackay would prefer for Celtic FC women to be detrimented and have another positive advert for Celtic end. Ironically, this decision contradicts the club's statement following the cancellation of away tickets for the recent SWPL Glasgow Derby. Uh, at a critical time in both the men's and women's season, we have no desire to engage in a public spat which may distract the positive support for both teams. For this reason, as well as for unforeseeable circumstances, it is regrettable that we will not attend the upcoming Celtic FC women matches at Celtic Park. So the Green Brigade are not going uh, now to the women games and as a result of them being denied. The Celtic end, for me, <clears throat> I think it's a... I can't help but seeing the fact it's a poor decision from the club. Now, on the face of it, that's we don't know anything further than that, all we've seen is this Green Brigade statement. Celtic might come out and say something later on. We don't know, but I, I can't help but feel this is a bad one. And at a time where the women's game's certainly on the up uh, in Scotland, you see it getting a lot of coverage on, on Sky Sports and what happened last year when, when the fans get into Celtic Park and gave the team a right good atmosphere. They broke the record attendance for women's matches in Scotland twice at Celtic Park, uh, twice in a row. Doesn't look like that's going to be the case this year. And the first advert, so after that statement, if you go into the Celtic FC website, the first thing that's there, 27th of March, which is today, is Paradise Awaits for Celtic FC Women. The tickets are now on sale for those two games. And the Celtic end isn't happening. So, I don't know, Quinny, what do you think of it? I think it's absolute self-harm, you know, talking yeah. about cutting your nose off to spite your face, because, like, on so many levels, like, just to be frank about it all, women's football is a commercial endeavour. For Celtic, you know, it's not like it's something that you know we were chatting about this uh, earlier on when we were kind of previewing what were uh, the rundown for the show or whatever. But like women's football is now starting to take off in a big way, and yeah, it's fantastic for girls playing football and the women's game in general and whatever. But when it is like Celtic that are doing it, or you know any other nor- uh, men centric club that you want to think about, it is an extension of what the club already does. You know, so the yeah. men's football operation funds the women's football operation because women's football makes very little money by comparison, you know, and I know the players and the coaches are all paid in kind and it's not like they're on men's wages in in that regard and there's an imbalance eh, necessarily, but the club should be advertising the women's department as as it were, like Mm -hmm. to the best of its ability, you know, so when they're trying to attract players, even when they're trying to build the fan base, allowing, you know, like actual Celtic fans to come and support yeah. Celtic in the stadium yeah. the best way possible is surely the inspiration you want to give the like the the wholehearted women's fan base. Like yeah. we can be that confident at games, we can sing these songs. That's have that's a good way of organizing. And you know, and I know they'll come to men's games and it won't be that different, but it then 
gives the women, the actual players for Celtic, like that that advantage that we have at Celtic Park with the fans, you know, because like in modern football, so much of it in modern men's football, so much of it is taken away by money. Like you need to have elite players in all positions and all this crazy money and all the rest of it. Whereas like 20, 30 years ago, yeah, there was a bit of that, but like spirit, determination, camaraderie, atmosphere, all that kind of stuff played a huge part in football, which is a big part of the success that we have had on the continent. There's no two ways about it. And in women's football, you really get an opportunity to have your time again. Like the standard of women's football today and where it is like evolutionary wise, is not too different to like the sixties or something like that. You know, yeah. like terms of how many clubs there are, how how ferocious the competitions are, and all the like for men or the seventies or whatever. So like, it's a huge opportunity missed for me. Like, you really want to get that Celtic team doing as well as possible in every way, shape, and form. And the club should want to support them with more ticket sales, with more finances, when they're hosting them in the big stadium, you know, they should want to try and sell the hang out, you know, like Barcelona do it, you know, with Barcelona have the women's team play at the new camp and all the rest of it, like they fill the thing out. There's no, yeah. eh, there's no two ways about it. And uh, Celtic taking this into being like personal, political between fan and directors and like tit for tat stuff and yeah. all the rest of it, it is self harm, you know. Yeah, it's, it's a bad decision. It's, it's only going to bring negative consequences rather than positive ones. And at a time where the women's team are in a really tight title race, like the men's team, you want them to, to have the best support they can. And that gave them the extra edge in the games last season at Celtic Park, definitely. And gave the players a massive boost for them to play in front of that. It was unbelievable. And they've just been denied that opportunity again. So like you say, it's self-harm from the club. They're going to get a lot of criticism from this over the next couple of days. But we don't know. There might be other things come out. We're not entirely sure. One thing I have seen, it was just scrolling on social media there, that the the video they've used to promote the ticket sales for the game, the official club stuff, does use a video of the Celtic end from last season. Now, I don't know, is, is that a bit contradictory? Is that a bit being hypocritical that they're not letting them in and they're using clips of them to promote it? I don't know. Up for so, so, so is it they're not letting them in, or is it like they're not selling them a batch of tickets to sit together? Yeah, so it's I'll I'll go get back up. It's the club has refused to facilitate the sale to Ken. So, yeah, so they're letting them in, right? But they're not letting them have the the whole sale to Ken behind the behind the goal that they had. And eventually, the game in the North Curve stream is to have that for the men's games as well. And listen, I think yeah. it's a pretty good concept, but I do know a lot of fans who for the men's team majority of people I sit with, family members, don't want that. They think that they, they, they refuse to move their seats. They're like, why should we move? But at the same time, you've got to think of the positives that would bring to the team, the increase in atmosphere it would bring. You look at the yellow wall at Dortmund, how good that is. So, I don't know, it's, it just feels like it's a step back from the club at the minute in terms of, we, we know they've had this spat, the ongoing spat with the Green Brigade and the relationship there isn't too good, but got to come together and We've seen how it benefited the team last season. And it's just a shame that they've been denied the opportunity to have it. Yeah, because like bottom line, like Celtic have just turned down a couple of thousand ticket sales. Yeah, exactly. There is no yeah. doubt. There is, <laughs> there is, exactly. There is absolutely no doubt that more fans would go to that game if the Celtic end was there. Like, yeah. absolutely no doubt. Uh, I know people who will go and sit in the Celtic end, stand in the Celtic end and sing the songs for the full 90. And now they're not going to be able to do that. So, well, well done, Celtic. You've probably done yourself a bit of harm here. Yeah, big time. Um, so normally, Josh, we, we finish the podcast on a wee bit more of a, a positive note. We try and do a little score prediction for the weekend. We've previewed, I think, Livingston, and you know we're going to have we're going to have the boys in green uh, in the stands uh, away to the the, the, the pasta dome, <laughs> the pasta bowl, <laughs> uh, the spaghetti had uh, this weekend. And, you know, we absolutely demolished Livingston not that long ago. I feel that the team is in that ascendancy, but with the question marks that we still have at this point, like who is the defence for this weekend and who will be the third midfielder? I don't know if I can be quite as confident of a scoreline repeat, but yeah. I do think we get three or four in this one and the clean sheet is, I'm not too sure we get it. I think Joe Hart needs a clean sheet or two before the end of the season. Yeah. I did think yeah. I was going to predict this to be 4-1, but I'm going to go with 4-0. I think Joe gets a clean sheet in this one. 4 0 is an interesting one. I'm going to be a bit less, bit less positive. I'm going to go with a 2 0. I think just this game 
for me, it's one I've earmarked. Like, you know how you look at the fixture lists when you're a fan and you look at, oh, that's a tough game. Look forward to that one. That'll be an easy game. This is one I've been looking at for a while, thinking last game before the derby, away at Livingston. The last time we'll probably play Livingston away because they're going to go down. I'm very, not scared of this game, but you know you have that bit of comprehens- uh, comprehension. A wee bit of just, don't know, just a wee bit of trepidation. fear. Yeah, trepidation, that's the word. So, I don't know, but I, th- I still think Celtic will come through and get three points. I think 2-0 victory. It'll be interesting to see how Livingston set up for this one because obviously when they came to Celtic Park in the Cup, they played a bit of football, played the attack and scored two goals and held Celtic into the 86th minute. Whereas, seemingly, when we played them before early in the season, they didn't register a shot on goal when they came to Celtic Park. So it'll be interesting to see which version of Livingston we see. Is it going to be the football terrorism Livingston or is it going to be the Livingston that tried to play some football. Well, David Martindale's got nothing to play for other than his boyhood club. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so what, what have they got to gain by sitting in? Yeah. Hee haw. That, right. That's good for us. We want to release some space yeah. because that's where we that's where we kill teams, you know. That's true. That's true. That's a tough pitch. Like you say, a bit of debate surrounding the team. Will it be Carter Vickers? Will it be Scales, etc.? Who gets the midfield spot? But it's good that we have these dilemmas. Yeah, for sure. To anyone that is going to the game, travel safe, uh, have fun, uh, and hail, hail, Josh. We'll see you next week. Hail, hail, mate. Cheers. See you next week.